to 1 Samuel chapter 28 and reading the 25 verses of the chapter. Now it happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight with Israel. And Achish said to David, you assuredly know that you will go out with me to battle, you and your men. So David said to Achish, surely you know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, therefore I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him, and buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. The mediums, of course, were those who possessed a conjuring spirit. In fact, we might even say simply they were the ones who possessed ghosts. Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes, and he went, and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, Please conduct a seance for me, and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. Then the woman said to him, Look, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. Incidentally, that word is the word Elohim, which means God in the Old Testament. For example, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But it's also a term in the Old Testament that refers to judges and others who have certain authority that comes ultimately from God. So what we are to understand by this is a celestial being. I saw a spirit, that is a spirit being from heaven, ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, what is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up and he's covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. The Hebrew text says he knew that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. And evidently the reason he knew it was Samuel was because of the fact that he was wearing the ma'il, or the mantle, which was the mantle that prophets wore. And you remember Samuel is the first in the line of the prophets. Now Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I'm deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me, and does not answer me any more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called you that you may reveal to me what I should do. Then Samuel said, so why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the, torn the kingdom out of your hand and giving it, given it to your neighbor David, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. You may remember that Saul 
disobeyed the Lord two very critical, very critical times. And the first of these was when he did not follow God's specific directions that he should destroy Amalek and destroy all of their properties, man, woman, and child, and Saul refused to do it. And so that's the sense of no execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell full length on the ground and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel, and there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no food all day or all night. And the woman came to Saul and saw that he was severely troubled and said to him, Look, your maidservant has obeyed your voice, and I have put my life in my hands and heeded the words which you spoke to me. Now, therefore, please heed also the voice of your maidservant, and let me set a piece of bread before you and eat, that you may have strength when you go on your way. But he refused and said, I will not eat. So his servants together with the woman urged him, and he heeded their voice. Then he arose from the ground and sat on the bed. Now the woman had a fatted calf in the house, and she hastened to kill it, and she took flour and kneaded it and baked unleavened bread from it. So she brought it before Saul and his servants, and they ate. Then they rose and went away that night. May the Lord bless this reading of his word, and let's bow together in a moment of prayer. The subject for today as we continue our exposition of certain important aspects of the life of David is Saul, Samuel, and the witch of Endor. When I was a relatively young Christian, I was introduced to some of the volumes of a British expositor by the name of W.T.P. Wollstone. Mr. Wollstone was a businessman, but a very popular expositor of the Word of God in Scotland, and wrote 10 or 15 volumes of expositions. One of them I particularly remember, and still have it in my library, and it's called The Night Scenes of Scripture. And it's a treatment of a number of passages in the Bible which happened in the nighttime. And naturally, one of the chapters that you might expect, first of all, would be the chapter on Nicodemus and our Lord. <clears throat> well, there are other chapters in which, surprisingly, important things happened in the nighttime. Now, First Samuel, if you have been reading along with me, has a number of night scenes itself. You remember, for example, when Saul and Abishai, when David and Abishai enter Saul's camp and come to Saul who is asleep. That was a night scene. There are actually six or eight of them in the book. But this one that we're looking at in this chapter is surely one of the most striking. When Saul and the two men are with him, who come to visit the witch of Endor. Think about it for a moment. Israel's anointed king stoops to consult a witch. Well, as you think of Saul's life, there are other things that appear in this chapter also. The darkening shadows of divine retribution are gathering around Israel's rejected king. Someone has put it like this. The ministers of vengeance are gathering like vultures to the prey. From the invisible ether, first a speck and then a vulture, till the air is dark with pinions, 
And as Saul's life draws to its close, I think you can appreciate some of the sense of that in that king's life. Well, the chapter is very simple. It records the Philistine invasion of Israel, particularly in the north at Shunem, near Mount Gilboa, and Saul's terror in the light of it. And then the visit of the king to the witch and the appearance of Samuel. And finally, the miserable collapse of the weak king in the last few verses of the chapter. So we look at it in that way. And first of all, in the first six verses, the Philistine invasion and the terror that it produced in the life of King Saul. Evidently, the Philistines were encouraged by what they saw as a rapid decline in Saul because now they attempt to invade the land. They don't invade it in the south, as you might expect, but they rather go up the seacoast, and then in the relatively northern part of the land, they turn east and go to Shunem, not far from Mount Gilboa, on which, of course, Saul and Jonathan and others will eventually lose their lives. It begins, the account of it in these six verses, with an account of David's deception. Achish still does not know that he has an enemy right by his side. And as they prepare for battle, he says to David, you assuredly know that you will go out with me to battle, you and your men knowing, of course, that David was an Israelite, but now he's going to have to fight the Israelites. In effect, he said, David, you know what you're entering into, don't you? And so David, characteristically, at this point in his life, gives an ambiguous reply. He says, surely you know what your servant can do. In other words, he doesn't really answer specifically, but he gives Achish the idea that he's in sympathy with what he's doing. He's in the embarrassed situation in which he has to lie, in effect, because of his sin. We love, we believers, in the sovereign grace of God to speak about the providence of God. And uh, it is one of the great doctrines of the Word of God and uh, the foresight of the Lord God the reason he has foresight, of course, is because he has foreordained things that come to pass. But in any way, we rejoice in the providence of God. But have you ever noticed this about the providence of God? That the providence of God has a manifest tendency to allow troubles to cross the path of us when we are doing something wrong, just when for our own purposes, it would be desirable to have our path quite clear. In other words, uh, just when we think that uh, providence is arranging all of our circumstances and we're going to do something that's contrary to the will of God, providentially, we are embarrassed by the things that happen. So, there is a law of providential vexation, if I may put it that way, that when you step out of the will of God, providence suddenly steps in your way. So rejoice in the doctrine of divine providence, but remember that when you step out of God's will, there is a law of providential vexation. And you will find that when you step out of the will of God, providence arranges circumstances so that you're embarrassed by what happens to you. And that's precisely what has happened here. David, if he believed in the providence of God, I assume that he did, he discovers now, of course, that providence has so arranged it in the light of his deception that he's embarrassed. He has to lie in the midst of the circumstances. Well, the military confronta confrontation is described in verses 3 and 4. Saul had, Samuel had died, and now the Philistines and the Israelites are gathered over against each other up near Gilboa. 
And Saul is very much disturbed about what has happened. And so we read in verses 5 and 6, when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. The reason Saul trembled, of course, was because of his rebellious spirit. He's going contrary to the will of God. He has not done the things that he should, and God has finally pronounced, I've torn the kingdom from you, Saul, and I've given it to your neighbor. That's an interesting word used with reference to David. I've given it to your neighbor. I've given it to David. So he has a rebellious spirit, and he has a guilty conscience, and the Philistine army now, evidently a rather significant army, located over against him. And so they bring on the desperation of despair in the life of King Saul. And this great king, this great man who began his life so wonderfully, now trembles at the shaking of a leaf. You know, it is true, if you study the Word of God, that men may see God and not find Him. We often say that uh, no one who seeks God will fail to find Him. Well, if you're speaking about a true seeking of the Lord God, yes. But if you're, saying, if you're saying that anyone who seeks Him, who is rebellious against Him and persisting in His rebellion, and that He will find Him, then Saul is the answer to your proposition. A man may seek God, God, seek Him untruly, and not find Him. Now, there are so many contradictions in this story, if you just think about it for a moment. Could the person who hated and persecuted Samuel and David, who were both prophets, could he expect to be answered by the prophets? Well, that's, of course, what he says. Saul inquired of the Lord. The Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. But Saul is the individual who hates Samuel does not follow his advice, let's put it that way, and he hates David and is trying to kill him. And David's a prophet. New Testament is authority for that. The writing of the Word of God is also authority for it. Could the individual who has slain the high priest, for he slew the high priest, remember, back in the earlier chapters the account is given, can he expect to be answered by the Urim of the ephod? Or could he that had sinned away the spirit of grace expect to be answered by dreams? Be not deceived, my Christian friend. God is not mocked. There are often times when we get down upon our knees and ask God to help us in this way and that way when there are things in our lives that He's been speaking to us about and Saul is a beautiful illustration of the fact that those times are often times of silence, and we do not hear that God has answered our problems because the problem lies within. And so we read, when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him. In other words, the Lord was silent did not answer him. As later on in verse 15, Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And he says, he's deeply disturbed. God has departed from him, does not answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by dreams. He doesn't mention the high priest this time because he's slain the high priest. Therefore, I've called you that you may reveal to me what I should do. Silence of God. What dreadful silence and loneliness is the silence produced by our sin when we turn to the Lord God. We read of the silence of the desert, the silence of midnight, the silence of the churchyard and the grave. But there's something more profound and more appalling than all of those silences. It's the silence of God when appealed to by the sinner in his extremity as in Saul's case. It's not the silence of indifference on God's part. It's not the silence of inability to hear. 
It's not the silence of weakness nor of perplexity. Uh, God does not sit in heaven saying, well, this is a difficult situation. I don't exactly know what I ought to do. I need to think about this for a good while. It's not the silence of any of these things, but it's the silence of rejection. It's the silence of displeasure. It's the silence of abandonment. It's the kind of thing that Scripture is talking about when it says, Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. And so in Saul's case, what he finds is dreadful silence. So now in verse 7 through verse 19, the author of the book tells us about his consultation of the witch of Endor. Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, in fact, there's a woman who's a medium at Endor, not too far away. Obstinate Saul, driven by unbelief. Three courses open to him. He might sit down in quiet hopelessness and let the evil come. Or he might, in penitent faith, true repentance, commit the whole matter to God even amid the awful silence, or he might take himself to hell for counsel, since heaven, it seems, were deaf. So he chooses the last. God has cast me off, I'll betake myself to Satan. Heaven's door is shut, so I'll see if hell's door is open. It's a terrible situation in which an individual finds himself. So he seeks a witch. Incidentally, the Bible speaks about witches and wizards. Wizard is a term that comes from the German word wissen, which means to know. So a wizard is an individual who is supposed to know certain things that others don't know. Now we use the term in many ways, we might say, of uh, an individual who is the coach of a football team. He's a football wizard. He knows things that others don't know. So Saul is going to consult a medium, one who is the possessor of a ghost or a conjuring spirit that can be called up to give information about the life beyond the grave. Saul's not longing for repentance. He's longing for a revelation of the future. And necromancy, or the consultation of the dead, is the polar opposite of prophecy. So since he hasn't received any information from the prophets, since he hates the prophets and is trying to kill one of them, one of them is already gone, so he appeals to necromancy. Now the scriptures speak so plainly about the sin of consulting mediums and false teachers and Madame Julia or whoever it may be. You walk right down the street, and as an interesting, isn't it interesting usually in the parts of town which indicate that they're clearly having difficulties in life, you find the sign out in front. Madam Geraldine, she'll be glad to give you a reading. And so you want to go there and expect to find an unfolding of the future? Listen, the true wizard, the true one who knows is up there, Saul, not down here. But he has become so disobedient and rebellious that he seeks the clairvoyant. It's rather interesting to me, you'll pardon me for saying this, I'm sure. He said, find me a woman who is a medium. Now, I don't think that women are the only ones who are mediums. But I think it's certainly, it seems to me true, that the vast majority are females. You usually find Madam so-and-so, not Mr. So-and-so, who will give you a reading. I don't know exactly why that's so. But this one evidently was a female power witch because she was well known in the territory. There's one over at Endor. So what we have is a pathetic picture of a king in dis disguise creeping through the night. I couldn't help but think of the ways in which our problems with Iran began. Robert McFarlane,
flying to Tehran in disguise, in disguise, mind you, he and a few were going to make contact with Iran. So he entered the airport, and it was known who he was. But here is one of our national security advisors entering in disguise in Iran. Isn't that striking? It's no wonder the Iran-Contra affair ended as it did. It began on a sour note. Mr. Reagan, I know, would love to have a number of things back. But here is Saul in disguise creeping through the night in order to have a word with a witch. The absurdity of what he tells the witch of Endor when she said, look, Saul has already said that if we practice our art, he's going to do away with us. You'll notice back in the third verse it was stated, and Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land earlier. But it's obvious that it was something he wasn't fully in harmony with, or at least in sympathy with. So in the ninth verse she said to Saul, look, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? Now notice how Saul replies. This is so characteristic of us. He said, as the Lord lives. He swore to her by the Lord. Here is a man who swore to her by the Lord and furthermore underlines it by saying, as the Lord lives. Now, what was Saul's duty? Well, his duty as a king is to punish her, and he knew it. Yet he swears not to do it, as if he could by his own oath, mind you, bind himself from doing that which by the divine command he was bound to do. You see the contradictions? He swore by the Lord, as the Lord liveth. He promised more than he could perform, of course, because he said there was sure no punishment happened to you. But he couldn't secure himself from punishment, and he could much less secure her from eternal punishment, which is the real punishment. But can you imagine? A king now whose duty is to rid the land of spiritists and mediums, going to a medium in disobedience and rebellion and swearing to her by the Lord. <laughs> by the Lord. Twice he swore by the Lord, saying, as the Lord liveth. He goes to extremes. It's like an individual who is out of fellowship with the Lord and knows is disobedient, and gets down upon his knees and prays and makes no reference whatsoever to the controversy that exists between him and the Lord. Now Samuel appears. The woman says, whom shall I bring up for you? He says, bring up Samuel for me. And you would expect at this point to read, and she brought up Samuel. But we don't read that. We read, when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice, a loud shriek. Obviously, something has happened of which he's ignorant. Saul says, oh, for Samuel now. And he appears, and the witch of Endor cries out. Something's happened over which he didn't have any control, evidently. Well now, what happened really? Did Samuel really appear? Is this a conjuring spirit? Or is this illusion? Evidently she was off a little bit from Saul because we do read later on that she came to Saul. So uh, it's possible she went off a little bit like uh, a witch might do so that you're not able to watch her too carefully because she might play a few tricks. But before she even called, Samuel appears. 
Well, there have been different explanations of this. Uh, for example, some have said this is a conscious deception by the witch, a well-played piece of jugglery on Saul's superstitious mind. Perhaps she recognized Saul and out of revenge deceived him because after all he had rid the land of the spiritus to some extent at least and maybe by his height he stood head and shoulders above the other, others in the land. Uh, something about him made her feel that this is really Saul and so it was just conscious deception on her part. Others have said it was an illusory appearance by demonic arts, a medium of divine revelation. This was the view of Luther and Calvin and Augustine. But I want you to note what the text says. I know to disagree with Luther and Calvin and Augustine is something you don't hear too often in Believer's Chapel, but nevertheless, I want you to look at the text because in the final analysis, we look at the text. And so, did an illusory appearance of Samuel take place? We read in verse 11, bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, not the appearance of Samuel, but saw Samuel. Verse 14, and Saul knew that it was Samuel. Now Samuel said to Saul, verse 16, then Samuel said, and verse 20, immediately Saul fell full length on the ground and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel. So far as the text is concerned, there isn't any indication at all that this was an illusory appearance by demonic arts. So I suggest that what this is is a real appearance of Samuel, a real apparition evoked by the divine will and power. And the very fact that the woman is startled by what happens indicates she wasn't prepared for what took place. She cries out with the Hebrew text says, a great voice, the way in which the Lord cries out in the New Testament, with a great voice, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was a loud shriek. She herself was terrified by what she actually saw. So she's shocked. And therefore I suggest that what we really have here is a true appearance of Samuel. It's almost as if uh, you have a situation that's very similar to a scene in Hamlet when uh, the king, um, someone says, this spirit dumb to us will speak to him. So uh, it may be that in the light of the fact that uh, this is a king, uh, these arts that which he practiced would work much better than with someone else. Well, uh, I therefore take, take this that this is a reference to Samuel himself. And Samuel does not come merely by divine permission, which is much too little to say, but rather it was by the special command of God himself that Samuel appeared. And uh, therefore, I take this to be a true appearance of Samuel, that is the person. But the form in which he appeared is a form that reminds Saul immediately of the reality of the appearance. Now the conversation begins in verse 15 with, Now Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I'm surprised that he didn't start out by saying, now Saul, really your basic problem is your loss of self-esteem. And uh, let's deal with that first, then we can deal with these other matters. But no, Saul's problem is not his loss of self-esteem. Saul's problem is his disobedience. It's his sin. It's his rebellious spirit. And fundamentally, my Christian friend, that's our problem too. That's the problem in the experiences of life as a Christian the disobedient spirit that we still have within us, the sin principle that dwells within us. 
And if by God's grace we are enabled to walk in harmony with His Word, we cannot do that perfectly, of course, but if we make it the aim of our life to walk by His Word insofar as we're enabled by God, and when we fall to go directly to Him in confession and sin, then we won't have any problem with self-esteem or anything else. We'll have the right view of ourselves, the accurate view of ourselves, which leads to peace and happiness and fruitfulness in the Christian life. So, no, the problem of Saul is not self-esteem. It's the distress that now grips his spirit by virtue of his disobedience. Actually, Saul has already been given the answer. Over and over again, it has been told him, you have disobeyed the Lord God. God has torn the kingdom away from you and he's given it to David. So he had the answer. What Saul wants to do is to know his fate, but he doesn't want to repent. Doesn't want to change his mind. So, you know, when you think about this, so much contradiction is in this. Samuel, while he's living as the prophet of God, has said, Saul, you're disobedient, you're rebellious. Listen, it meant so much to Samuel that Saul sinned that we read in the, about the 15th chapter that, saw, that Samuel well, wept all the night over the disobedience of Saul in the case of the Amalekites. He wept all night, one of the great night scenes of Scripture for that matter. He's already been given his answer. But he comes to Samuel as if the dead Samuel, who is now in the presence of the life beyond the grave, as if the dead Samuel would favor one that God had frowned upon, as if he would go back on his word, as if now that he's in the life beyond the grave and enjoying that life, he'll change his mind about what he did with reference to Saul when he was alive. So foolish, so contradictory. Well, the miserable collapse of Saul is described in the last verses, verse 20 through verse 25. He learns that good counsel comes from God alone and his institutions. The institution of the prophets and the priesthood were designed by God to help the people of God. If we hear not Moses and the prophets, Men will not be persuaded, though someone rises from the dead. How important that is. If you do not pay attention to the Word of God, if you and I do not listen to what Scripture says, no miraculous experience will mean anything to us. God has committed His Word to us as the means by which He speaks to us, and we are responsible to yield obedience and submission to that word. And we are given the presence of the Holy Spirit and His power to enable us to do precisely that. We read in verse 20, Immediately Saul fell full length on the ground and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel. There was no strength in him, for he had eaten no food all day and night. Partly from bodily exhaustion, no food, partly from mental distra distress, he acted as if the Philistine archers had already hit him. Look, there's no light at the gates of hell. I think there's one of the most interesting contrasts here in the latter part of this chapter. We have Samuel speaking truth. He speaks it tenderly. There's no question about that. But he speaks from the invisible world. And uh, he sees things in a clear moral light now. And he's restrained by what has happened to him and by the judicial facts of Saul's life from manifesting any sympathetic action for the king. Samuel's in the invisible sphere. So he knows the truth as the truth is, and he knows there is no place for human sympathy. 
for something that God has determined in his infinite counsel of loving kindness and mercy. So he speaks the truth to Saul. But look at the woman, the witch. Now in the case of the witch, really there's something rather beautiful about her conduct. She's the witch, but now the old cunning, moral insensibility, cynicism of the witch are set aside and the humane feelings of her soul find expression and free exercise. Suggestive to us of the fact that in human beings there is a germ of true humanity created by God that underlies the accretions of a guilty life. And so she tenderly, gently does what she possibly can for the fallen king, the rebellious king, the unrepentant, impenitent king, and gives him nourishment for his exhausted frame. Sympathy with the righteous judgments of God does not extinguish pity for those who fall under them, for true men. So in the fallen greatness we see the majesty and the dishonor, the possibilities and the actualities of our common humanity. It's as though a large part of ourselves has come to grief, and though we cannot but deplore the sin, we feel disposed to weep over the lost one, and it's perfectly proper for us in our sinful bodies to do that. The fact that we do is an evidence of our true humanity. But Samuel, who speaks from the life beyond the grave, speaks in the light of the justice of God's word and the justice of God's truth. And when one gets there, then the importance of God's truth so grips us that sympathy for evil is banished forever. I think we see this something, something of this in our Lord himself who wept over the lost city of Jerusalem proclaiming its sin and departure from him but nevertheless at the same time speaking of its righteous doom because of it. Very interesting, that contrast. Let me say just a few words in way of conclusion. The inevitable issue of unbelief, one sin leads to another throughout eternity. One sin persisted in, not forgiven by the saving ministry of Jesus Christ, the sinful life ultimately leaving this life unforgiven enters into the eternity that is to come and the sins that are part of human nature continue, one following right after the other, accounting for the eternal punishment that lies ahead. The inducements to sin are unbelieving fear, trying to find peace by a false view of the deity, unhallowed cu curiosity regarding the future, foolish presumption, fancies to find God's, God by its own means. If God cannot be found in false ways, men in the true ways, and in the true spirit, man seeks out a substitute. And in Saul's case, it was the witch of Endor. But above all, the pathetic tragedy of unrealized promise, the story of a man whose life ran headlong to ruin. Men may be left to themselves by God, like Judas. Marvelous man, great powers and great abilities. But by the rejection of our Lord Jesus Christ, his life ends in the hanging of himself and self-destruction. Jesus said, the Son of Man goeth as it was determined concerning him, but woe to that man through whom the Son of Man is betrayed. And why do men sometimes seek God in their sins? 
and are, do not find him? Well, for the simple reason that divine mercy is free, but it's righteous in its flow. It always flows in the realm of the teaching of Holy Scripture. The notion that God must help everyone who appeals to him is based on sheer ignorance and is profoundly unscientific. Even in home and society, we recognize the necessity of moral conditions of receiving attention and favor. So the abandonment of Saul and followed by the silence of God. Silence of God and the words of Samuel show that practically this was the question for which no answer was possible. The answer had already been given. It's too late, Saul, too late. And so it is in human life still. Men persist in evil ways at home or in business till the ruin of domestic peace and of their prospects is inevitable and no course is open for retrieval. The question of the jailer, what must I do to be saved? And the answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, is a question and an answer that may be part of our lives at a particular point, but if we persist and keep on in disobedience, the future of Saul becomes the future of us and others. The question of the jailer, what must I do to be saved, is an opportune question, and there is an opportune answer. But if men persist in scorning God, then the question becomes, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? You know, I noticed something this week I never noticed before. I'll just state this as I close. Have you ever noticed that when the Bible speaks about the future and the judgment of the future, that there is never any objections to it in our Lord's parables, for example, in which he speaks about it? In other words, just as Saul, when the word came to him, he doesn't say, that's unfair, that's unjust. But deep down within him, in his collapse, that's all he can do. It's right, it's just, it's fair. And even against himself, he realizes it in his utter separation from God. Jesus tells a number of parables about the future. In every one of them, when he pronounces the judgment, there's no objection. It's no, it's unjust. It's unfair. There is a kind of dumb assent on the part of individuals to the ultimate judgment of God. They bow to the sentence of the eternal God and speak as if they know it's just. The rich man in Hades lifted up his eyes, did not say, it's unfair, it's unjust, but send someone to cool my tongue and send someone also to speak to my brothers that they may not come here and the answer comes, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, they won't hear if someone rises from the dead. My friend, the Word of God is the answer to our needs, and it's that which stands with, between us and under us and around us in our relationship to the Lord God. It's a terrible message but it's part of God's inspired word. If you're here today and you've never believed in Christ, remember there is an opportune time. What must I do to be saved? The jailer said, Paul gave the apostolic and the divine answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Flee to him for mercy because he's offered an atoning sacrifice for sinners. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't add anything to it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. May God bring you to that decision. Let's stand for the benediction. 
Father, we thank Thee and praise Thee for the chapters of the Word of God that often are very troubling to us, for so often we do turn aside from that which Scripture teaches us. O oh God, deliver us from our sin, deliver us from a rebellious spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, guide our steps in paths that are pleasing to Thee. Keep us from evil. And Lord, if there are some here who have never believed in Christ, turn them to Christ right at this moment. For Jesus' sake, amen. <coughs>